Hello, this is Lee Gersman. But you're not listening to Lee Gersman's show. You're listening to Raviera's show. He is too cheap to do his own intro. But this is the Vieira Vault. And this is Ralph's show. So take it away, Ralph. Well, thank you, Lee. And it's another Vieira Vault show. And uh, still have no intro. But, uh, oh well. Anyway, this week, um, a lot of people uh, have uh, told me they love my concert stories from back in the day. So, uh, this will probably be volume one, because I've been to a trillion concerts. So, I'll just tell you what I can think of now on this episode, and tell you my little concert stories. A lot of them are unique, a lot of them are epic a lot of them crazy things happened at, and uh, I guess I'll start off with the very first show I've ever been to. Now, back in the day, there was a lot of shows I missed out on, epic shows, historic shows, because my parents wouldn't let me go to shows. So uh, the very first time, I well, technically the first time I ever saw a concert, a rock concert, was... Um, a local band called Freewheel. And they played at a park here on Miami Beach. I didn't leave. I didn't even live on Miami Beach at the time. They were called Freewheel. And all I remember about that show was the drummer was really good. And he played a really good drum solo. Then he jumped off the drum set and continued to do a drum solo on the mic stand. Thought that was pretty damn unique. And I thought it was pretty cool. But that wasn't really a concert. That was like some free, you know, show in a park, you know. But it was literally my first experience. But my official first concert ever was May 18th, 1979. And May 18th is a very, very special day for me because that's uh, the same day I released the first album from Thrash or Die, May 18th. Uh, 2011, I believe. And it wasn't supposed to be released that day, but what happened was uh, the pressing was done and they called me on May 18th to come pick up the CDs. And I said, holy fuck, you know, today's May 18th, so I automatically put it on sale that day just so I can have that release date. May 18th. Very special uh, day. And the concert that I saw was Cheap Trick and the Rockets. And the very first band I ever saw live was the Rockets. I don't know if any any out there remember the Rockets. But uh, they were a good band. I bought the first album soon after I saw that show. Uh, They did a really cool cover of uh, Fleetwood Mac's Oh Well. Which I'm sure you can see on... Or here on YouTube. And, um, And Cheap Trick. And... Man, my dad took me to this show. And uh, I remember how fucking insane it was to actually walk into a concert for the very first time. It was like a baptism. Like, wow, this is so cool seeing the t-shirts. And I bought a t-shirt. I bought actually a bootleg t-shirt outside that lasted about, I don't know, three weeks. That's one thing I got to tell you about concerts, uh, shirts, Concert shirts in the 80s were made very with very flimsy material. And not only the bootleg shirts outside. I bought many shirts inside, official merchandise. And I don't own any of the shirts except for one. Uh, the Miami Baseball Stadium show, it was Journey, Aerosmith. This is when they didn't even have uh, Joe Perry in the band. 82, 83. Frontiers Rockin' Hard Place Tour. Um, and I don't know. My mind is very hazy. I got to look for that shirt. Cause that shirt says all the bands that were on there. I know Sammy Hagar opened it and he, he was terrible. And, but anyway, going back to the cheap trick show, we had really good seats. I remember we we're pretty close to the stage, me and my dad. And, uh, my dad's pretty, a pretty conservative guy. You know, he's not into, you know, rock music and stuff. So we sit down and uh, the guys next to us were smoking weed. So my dad was pretty annoyed by that. And what he did was he lit up a cigar. 
and he blew it at him. And I thought we were going to get in a fight or something, but those guys were kind of intimidated by my dad. Anyway, uh, rockets were cool. All I remember was the singer wasn't wearing shoes and he jumped out in the audience and he sang to the crowd and I thought that was pretty cool. And then Cheap Trick came out, which at that time was one of my favorite bands and unbelievable. That was at, at Budokan. They were promoting at Budokan, that tour. And uh, all I, rem- I remember a lot about that show. I pretty much remember that set list. And the very first time I heard I Know What I Want, which uh, Rick Nielsen introduced as a song on our upcoming album, Dream Police, and Tom Peterson's going to sing this, so it was pretty cool to see that. Um, My second concert was The Cars at the same venue, Miami Highline, which was pretty close to my house. I'd say it was like, um, I don't know, like maybe four to five miles away. And uh, that one, my dad let me go with my friends. So I actually went to my with my friends to that one. And my third concert was my very first heavy metal concert, which was Black Sabbath on the Heaven and Hell tour. And I know that tour was um, Black Sabbath and Blue. It's called the Black and Blue tour. But when it came to Miami, the opening acts was the Johnny Van Zant band, who is now the singer of Leonard Skinner, brother of Ronnie Van Zant. And a band called Riot. And I know some of you out there know Riot. Uh, And this was like with Guy Speranza, which I actually ended up seeing again. And I got to tell that story because that was a crazy, crazy, crazy show I saw. The second time I saw Riot. But uh, the Black Sabbath show, I wasn't allowed to go to. My parents said I couldn't go. I think it was a weekday maybe. That's probably why. And none of my friends were going, so they didn't want me to go alone. So this is Black Sabbath. This is like my favorite band of all time. And they're only four miles away. And I was like, screw this. I'm going to this show. So I snuck out of the house, took a bus, got to the show. And oh my God, what a religious experience. They opened up with war pigs. Now, mind you, I mean, I wasn't really too familiar with Ronnie James Dio at the time. All I knew him from was Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell. But I also remember vividly they were giving away tickets on the radio and they said, name the band Ronnie James Dio was in before Black Sabbath. I didn't know the answer. That's how much I didn't know about Ronnie James Dio at the time. So yeah, they opened with War Pigs and here's this guy, man. Insanely, I mean, and also the loudest show. Every time I saw Black Sabbath, they were the loudest band live. Them and um, Motorhead. The two loudest bands I've ever seen live. Unbelievable religious experience to be up close. To get to see Tony Iommi and Geezer Butler right in front of me with Ronnie James Dio. On drums was Vinny Apice. Uh, Bill Ward did play on that album, but he didn't do the tour. At least... He didn't do that leg of the tour. I know he did some of the early shows. And uh, I walked home for four miles. I mean, I must have got home about two, three in the morning. And everything's dark in my house. And I go in, I turn on the light, and there's my dad with a belt in his hand. And I'm like, oh, shit. And my dad hit me. Many, many times with that belt. It hurt like a motherfucker. But it was worth every lash. I got to see Black Sabbath. And I bought a tour book, which I still own to today. And what I was saying earlier about shirts, shirts die. Tour books are forever. And I collect tour books. I mean, when I go to shows, I I have a killer collection of tour books. Now, let me, you know, there's a lot of shows that I'm going to forget that I uh, to mention on this uh, podcast, but I'll mention in future podcasts. I'll probably do a part two of shows I've seen. <clears throat> but um, uh, I saw Ted Nugent with... Uh, Pat Travers and the Scorpions open. 
Nobody knew who the Scorpions was, but I did. Because at that time, my brother uh, turned me on to Love Drive. He was stationed in Germany. I went to go visit him. And I got, uh, I knew Love Drive. That's all I knew. And I remember them playing Another Piece of Meat, uh, Loving You Sunday Morning, Coast to Coast. And I believe they played Love Drive too. Pat Travers came out. And that was the first time I ever seen Tommy Aldridge on drums. And he did this drum solo, which every time I've seen Tommy Aldridge since, he does the identical solo. Amazing drummer. He throws his sticks out and he does a drum solo with his hands like John Bonham used to do. Unbelievable. And then Ted Nugent, there's a Scream Dream tour. You know, I got to mention Scream Dream tour. Pat Travers was on Crash and Burn and Scorpions were on Animal Magnetism. Ted Nugent comes out swinging from a rope wearing a loincloth. I believe this was the only time he ever wore that. I know in the picture of Intensity Intensities, he's wearing a loincloth, but I'm not sure if he was wearing that during that tour. But I know he was doing it during uh, the Scream Dream. And man, what a performer Ted Nugent is. But believe it or not, the I've seen Ted Nugent, like, I don't know, maybe a dozen times since then. The best time I ever seen Ted Nugent was the last time. In 2016 was the best time I ever saw Ted Nugent. But that was great to see the Scream Dream Tour, which I love the fuck out of that album, which I recently reviewed on Lee Gertzman's show. Now, I know my timelines are all fucked up, but I believe the show I saw after that was Heart at the Hollywood Sportatorium. Ted Nugent was the Hollywood Sportatorium too. Maybe Heart was before Ted Nugent. I think it was. Hollywood Sportatorium was the mecca of arena shows in South Florida. Historic place that's no longer here, unfortunate. I was at the very last rock concert there, which was Judas Priest, which is now a Winn-Dixie. I mean, it's... The way the Hollywood Sportatorium was, you had to drive miles and miles of just trees. There was no houses, no nothing. In the midst of those trees, there was a Holiday Inn, which was odd. I think that's where the band stayed. About maybe a mile uh, east from there. And then you get this sportatorium. I mean, it's just out of nowhere. There's this big parking lot, big arena. On the other side of the parking lot was a racetrack. And the first show, yes, it, it must have been hard. Because it was the Bevel of Strange tour. Uh, and I think that album was before... Ted Nugent. I'm almost positive that was my first sportatorium show. And we had front row seats for that. Me and my friend Yai and uh, I believe Angel Marlowe, which I'm still friends with both those guys. And the opening band for that show was a band called Marze, who I thought were really fucking good. They were very, very young and they rocked hard. And I soon after bought the album and I still have that album to this day and the album's not that good. I thought they were better live. Anyway, uh, Sportatorium was a very special, special, special place. It, it's not that special when you get left there, which happened to me during uh, when I saw Styx. Now, I saw Styx there. The very first Styx show on the Paradise Theater Tour was there. And I went to, with my brother, so, you know, we got home okay. But then they came back on the Kilroy Was Here Tour. And I was with my friend, um, John, little John, and we got left there. The guy that took us, Richard LePage left us there and we literally walked, I don't know. So we had no money for a bus, you know, <clears throat> even when we got to like civilization, we didn't, we couldn't afford getting bus fare. Got my ass kicked again by my dad. Uh, for not being home for like over a day. Because it took us like over a day to get home. Sportatorium wasn't close. Oh wait, 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 wait. We did hitchhike and we got in back of a pickup truck for like a good amount of miles. So we did save quite quite a walk. But yeah, it took me over a day. Because we didn't get home to the next night. 
Richard LePage, the guy that left us there, he lived right across the street from my house. And when we got home, when I saw him, the first time I saw him, he was outside of his house washing his car. And I saw him and he literally had the fucking audacity, the balls to fucking laugh. So I walked across the street while he was laughing and punched him right in the face. And I remember I really, I hit him so hard. My hand swelled up. I fucked up my, my knuckles on his face. But uh, let me go back to, you know, shows I saw. I also saw Nazareth at the Sportatorium. That was one of the early ones, too. That was the first time I ever saw Pyro. And the opening act was Blackfoot. And, oh, my God, I love Blackfoot. That was amazing. Um, my very first stadium show, and this was awesome. Uh, it was maybe a year or two later. Or maybe it was the same year. I can't remember. I'm really bad with years. It was Heart, Blue Oyster Cult, Firefall, an Air Band, and I'll explain what that is in a second, and Motorhead. It was the very first Motorhead show in the United States. And when I met Lemmy in 91, I mentioned that to him. I said, Lemmy, I saw your very first show in the United States at the Miami Baseball Stadium. And he goes, I remember that, but that was the very first Motorhead show. I was here before with a band called Hawkwind. <clears throat> so, and then fast forward, I saw Motorhead a bunch of times after that, but I saw the very last Motorhead show in the United States, which was at Pompano Beach Amphitheater. So, you know, bookend. I got to see the very first U.S. show of Motorhead and the very last U.S. show of Motorhead. And uh, that one, they headline with Anthrax. But when I saw Motorhead that day, a uh, unique thing happened. During the week, uh, me and my friends were like always looking for the heaviest bands, you know? <clears throat> and um, on the radio uh, for that show, I mean, not the show, they had a, a promo for the Ace of Spades album, the brand new album at the time. And they would play the little promo where you'd hear about, I don't know, 10 seconds of the song Ace of Spades saying Motorhead's new album Ace of Spades catch them at the Miami Baseball Stadium with Heart, Blue Oyster Cole, and Firefall. Now, the air band I was talking about, there was a radio station down here called WSHE that they would, they had a contest at a bar, or I think it was the Button South, where you'd go up on stage and mimic a band. Like, you know, air guitar, but it was an air band. Like, you had an air drummer, an air singer, an air guitar player, an air bassist. These motherfuckers went up there and did uh, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights for Meatloaf. That's all they did. They went up there and mimicked it. Motorhead opened that show, and then them. What kind of bullshit's that? But I'll tell you, the uh, when, when I heard that Motorhead Ace of Spades commercial, I was telling my friends, oh my God, we got to get there early. This band is heavy and fast as fuck. Just by those that little clip of the song Ace of Spades. And when Motorhead came out, the whole field was sitting down. The whole field during their set. But I'll never forget, there was these two guys. And I remember they didn't have no shirts on. And they were going fucking ape shit for Motor, Motorhead. And they knew all the words. I do remember Motorhead, I I think they played Train Kepa Rollin. Or they played something I was familiar with. Could have been... But these guys were so into it, and uh, turned out they were from England. We, we we got to talking to them, and they knew Motorhead from England, so they were uh, they were fans. So there was two fans, but everybody else was sitting down scratching their heads. Even my buddies that were there were scratching their heads, and I was like, "Wow, holy fuck! I've never seen a band play that fast," you know. And I was on a mission to find a Motorhead album after that. I couldn't find Ace of Spades anywhere. But then again, I didn't have transportation to go to every record store. But my local record store, Ricky's Records, uh, which recently closed. It's been open all this time, but it just turned into a little Latin record shop. So I didn't care that they're gone. But 
they ended up getting a copy of uh, No Sleep Till Hammersmith, which to this day is my favorite Motorhead album. Now let's go back, well, let's go forward a little bit. I know I'm missing a bunch of shows. Uh, To the next time I saw Riot. Man, this was terrible. It was a great show, but what a terrible experience. It was Rush and Riot. Moving Pictures Tour. And this was at the Hollywood Sportatorium. Now, the Hollywood Sportatorium had a moat around it and a wall. If you can jump over that wall, you can see a show for free. But there was usually a lot of security around the wall, inside. So if you jumped over the wall, they'd catch your ass and throw you out. But sometimes you'd, you'd, you'd get away with it. So, I... um. Go see Riot and Rush, and I'm in. I'm in with my friend Claude, and we're in line, and they're not opening the gate, and it's getting late. It's already like after eight o'clock. Doors open at eight, and or I think no, the ticket said eight o'clock. I guess the show starts at eight, but they weren't opening the gate, and people started to get fucking crazy. And then there started be there were people like jumping over the wall, people getting kicked out, and then it was just getting fucking bad. And there was a a policeman that got hit over the head with a two by four. I saw it myself. This fucking guy walked up to a cop, hit him over the head, hit him in the back of the head. All hell broke loose. Riot police came out. And they dispersed tear gas into the crowd where I was. And let me tell you something. If you ever smell tear gas, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, it's like whiffing fire. It like burns your insides. So when they hit, the the tear gas hit um, the crowd, everybody's running. I, I fall to the floor and I start to get trampled. And my friend Claude grabbed me by the arm and just dragged me out. He saved my life. Terrible experience. Well, they they did actually, the show went on. They finally opened the gate. We were let in for the, I'm telling you, for that whole night. Every time I breathed in, it hurt. But how ironic. Opening band, Riot. Oh, one thing I forgot to talk about the Ted Nugent show was, um... After we left the show and went home, on the news, there was a riot at the Ted Nugent show after we left. I didn't see a thing. But there was, like, news crews there, and I remember seeing a a car on fire and people running around and cops chasing people, people getting arrested left and right. And I really can't tell you what exactly sparked the riot because when I left there, it was totally uh, calm, extremely calm. But uh, yeah, so it turns out the reason that they didn't open the gates to that Rush show was Neil Peart, Peart, Peart uh, was stuck in the Bahamas and couldn't get a plane out, something like that. So, you know, he was very late to the show. That's why they didn't open the gate, which is stupid. They should have just opened it and let people in because Neil Peart did make it and... That was my very first time seeing Rush, the moving pictures tour. But then I saw him soon after. They did a tour for Exit Stage Left. Now, back in those days, I was the master at winning tickets on the radio. It, it's not as difficult as it is today. Because today you got speed dialing or what have you. Back then, there was no such thing as speed dialing, but I had one of those phones, uh, and I knew that number to that radio station, and I can call it in record speed. So they had, uh, Rush had a show at Lakeland, Florida, which is pretty damn far from here. I don't know, four, five, six hours. And I won tickets. And what it was was the K-102 party bus. And what it was that you drove to the K-102 radio station, you'd get on their bus and drive to, and they'd drive you to the show. I borrowed my, um, Yai, my friend's dad's binoculars, 
to go see this Rush show. Me and my brother get there, and we're waiting for the bus. And back then, I used to smoke weed with my brother. And, you know, we're like, oh man, we're going to be in this bus for six hours, so let's get really high before we get on the bus. So uh, we get on the, uh, the bus shows up, smoking weed like crazy, bunch of joints. I walk into that bus fucking stoned out of my mind. And the bus takes off. Then the bus stops at a convenience store. And the DJ, the, her name was Randy Rhodes, oddly enough. That was the name of the DJ. And it was a female, but her name was Randy Rhodes. Spelled different than Ozzy's guitar player. They all walk in and we're waiting in the bus and they come back with a bunch, I mean, a bunch of beer and coolers and and they started passing beers out even to me and I was underage and they were feeding me beer. Ah, the 80s. So uh, now I'm drinking beer on the way to the show and this is the afternoon and I, I'm not like, Back then, I wasn't really a drinker. So I was there getting drunk with my brother. My brother was of age at the time. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, I smell something funny. I'm like, man, what's that smell? Wait, that smells like pot. And I'm seeing, I'm looking around where it's coming from. It's coming from the front of the bus. The DJ, Randy Rhodes, and all the other DJs are smoking weed. And I'm like, Manny, they're smoking weed. Holy fuck, you know? And then, like, everybody in the bus is like, oh, shit, everybody in that bus had weed. And I remember the guys, there was two dudes sitting on the seats right across from us. They had hash. So they we were, then I, we were passing joints. They were passing us bowls of hash. I was so fucking fucked up by the time we got to the Lakeland Civic Center that... I lost my brother somehow. I don't know. I think he was... I think he picked up a chick or was talking to a chick. And I didn't give a fuck. I wanted to see the show. So I walk in. And the next thing I remember, somebody's waking me up. I'm on the floor. I passed out. And when I woke up, I didn't have the binoculars. So I was like, "Uh uh-oh. I lost my, my friend's dad's binoculars. And believe me, he wasn't happy. But uh, I do remember that show, though. And I, as I recall, there was no opening act. Rush played extra long. And I remember the difference between that one and the moving pictures show I saw at the Sportatorium was on that show they played A Camera's Eye, which they didn't do at the Hollywood Sportatorium. Now I want to talk about the greatest band to see live in the 80s, bar none. Van fucking Halen. They played the Miami Highline and the Van Halen 2 tour. And my parents wouldn't let me go. This was 79. That's why. And believe me, that hurt. I also miss Van Halen because of my parents. When they opened for my favorite band of all time, Black Sabbath. Heaven and Hell. I mean, Never Say Die tour. And Van Halen's first album. Van Halen 2 was at the Miami Highline. Van Halen, Women and Children First was at the Sportatorium. Now, that I wasn't going to miss. So me and my friend Yai, now my parents were letting me go to shows. It's 1980, one year later. As long as I can go with friends, and they trusted Yai, and his dad would take us to the show and then pick us up. And back in those days, boy, ticket, I think the ticket for that Van Halen show was like 11 bucks, and... Eleven. I'm talking about eleven dollars front row and eleven dollars nosebleeds. Every seat in the house was the same price. And how you would get really close to the stage back then, really good seats, you'd have to get really go really early to where they sell tickets. And here back then, we used to go to a Sears, Sears and Robux. They would sell concert tickets, so. I believe, you know, tickets would go on sale like at 10 in the morning. And uh, we would get there like at 7 in the morning. And there would be like just a few people there. But then the line would grow as the hours would go by. So we ended up getting second row seats to Van Halen. Women and Children uh, First uh, Tour. 
I was second row on Michael Anthony's side. And greatest show I ever saw up to then, because then Van Halen outdid themselves the next time they came. But yeah, it was very cool being all the way up front. Never forget, they opened with Romeo Delight. Mind-blowing show. It was like the greatest live experience. I can't put into words how amazing this band was back then. The energy of the crowd, the energy of them playing, the way David Lee Roth commanded the audience, it was something I have never witnessed ever again. I've seen some amazing shows after that, but nothing compared to original Van Halen. The next time I saw Van Halen was on the Fair Warning Tour, and we had nosebleeds. It was me, my brother, and Yai again. That right there was the greatest show I ever saw in my life. And it was better than the show I saw up front. I saw Van Halen way back. And believe me, that night will go down in history in my mind as far as concerts go. I'll never forget the vision of Van Halen coming out during the Fair Warning Tour where it, when they would start, like you'd hear Eddie, you know, the band's warming up and it's all dark, but there's spotlights flying around the crowd. And then the guy would come out going, will you welcome the mighty Van Halen? And then they go into on fire and it's still dark. The, the you know, it's still dark, but you, the band is playing. And then when it goes into that part going, go, Bam! And then when a song kicks in, all the lights turn on. And right when the lights turn on, the first thing you see is David Lee Roth like 10 feet in the air doing a split. That's the first thing you see. The place was went ecstatic where you couldn't hear the band after that jump. It was like the crowd out, out, uh, out volume the band. And oh my God, it was just, it was just so special. You know, after like two songs, David Lee Roth would walk out right in the middle, uh, right in the front of the fucking stage, just one spotlight on him. He wouldn't say a word for, I don't know, two, three minutes because he couldn't. The fucking place was just yelling so loud. He was waiting for them to like, but he would just sit there with his mouth open. I'm sure this happened at every fucking show. That Van Halen played. They were just, oh man, they were monsters. <clears throat> uh, one thing I forgot about the Women and Children first tour was before we went to the show, they were on WSHE, our local radio station, with the most insane interview. You, It was just fucking crazy, which I still have to this day. Hmm, maybe that's the Vieira Volta pick this week that I'll play at the end of the show. Stick around and find out. Don't fast forward, you prick, because I got some great stories coming up. So I want to just stay talking about Van Halen. So then the next time Van Halen came, oh wait, to go back to Women and Children first, uh, also there was a part where I saw some guy threw a joint up on stage. And David Lee Roth held it up. He goes, what's this, Miami, or Hollywood, Florida? And one of the roadies ran out with a big lighter that had VH on it. That's how close I was. I could see the VH on the lighter. And he lit it up and David Lee Roth took a hit of it. Blows it out. He's like, God damn, that's some good ass weed, Miami or Florida. And I was like, and at that time, I wasn't smoking weed yet. This was 1980. I didn't start till like 81, I think. Which I haven't smoked weed in a very long time because I work for the city now. And they do random drug tests, so. Those days are over till I retire or maybe not. Who knows? So the next time I saw Van Halen after that, which by the way, I do have the Van Halen fair warning tour book and I have the diver down tour book, which was the next time I saw Van Halen was the diver down tour. Now the diver down tour was at the Hollywood Sportatorium for two nights, a Friday and Saturday. If I remember correctly, on that Friday, Judas Priest was playing Sunrise Musical Theater 
with Uriah Heep. And, man, thank God Van Halen played two shows, or I would have missed the Diver Down tour because Judas Priest was the bucket list band to see at that time. Now, mind you, Judas Priest was touring with Iron Maiden. So I was like, oh my God, I'll get to see Maiden too. This was Number of the Beast tour. Screaming for Vengeance, Number of the Beast. We get to the show. I go up to the fucking t-shirts to get a fucking Judas Priest and Iron Maiden shirt. And tour book, which I still have my Judas Priest Screaming for Vengeance tour book too. And I noticed no Iron Maiden shirts. And uh, Uriah Heap shirt. I was like, what? Turned out Iron Maiden wasn't playing that show. They did not. I I don't remember if it was announced as Judas Priest and Iron Maiden back then. But believe me, we all went to that show thinking Iron Maiden was opening. And I remember there was a guy with a banner. An Iron Maiden banner at the show hanging from the balcony. And boy, we were disappointed. But I wasn't disappointed with Judas Priest. Now, here's the ironic part. Uriah Heep at that time had Bob Daisley and Lee Kerslake, which is the rhythm section of Blizzard of Oz. And this was at Sunrise Musical Theater. I saw the Blizzard of Oz at the Sunrise Musical Theater, the Blizzard of Oz tour, but it was with Rudy Sarzo and Tommy Aldridge. So, funny enough, I did see the actual Blizzard of Oz lineup but in separate bands. And I will I will go back to the time I saw Blizzard of Oz, the Randy Rhodes. Only time I saw Randy Rhodes. But uh, Judas Priest, oh my God, I was very close. I was on KK's side. And I remember, man, Rob Halford would hit these highs that I would literally see like the speakers shake a little bit when he would like hit those super highs. That right there was hands down the best time I saw Judas Priest. And Judas Priest is one of those bands that always rule live. Uriah Ape was forgettable. I really didn't care. I didn't care for that album. And Boomagog, I think it was called. And I don't even care for Uriah Ape because everybody would point at, oh, you got to hear Magician's Birthday. And I did find that album like a few years back used somewhere, bought it, played it. I was like, this is doing nothing for me. So the next night I went to go see Van Halen. That was the first time I saw two shows back to back. And again, mind blowing Van Halen show. Not as good as fair warning, but neither was women and children first. Neither was any fucking show I've ever seen since fair warning. Number one show I ever saw in my life, but that doesn't get, take away how incredible Van Halen was. Uh, Diver Down was great. I saw the 1984 tour, and I could be wrong, but I believe that was the very first show of the tour. was at the Hollywood Sportatorium. Again, incredible show. Autograph opened that. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention. Every time Van Halen came, they came with a real shitty band opening, like unheard of band. Even Autograph at that time didn't have an album. But I remember, I, I can't remember the name of that of the band that opened the Diver Down tour, but that fucking band didn't even have a guitar player. It was the weirdest shit. It was a drummer, bass player, and keyboardist. No guitar player. It's like, what the fuck is this? And I can't even remember who opened Fair Warning or the... Women and Children First Tour because they were both unheard of bands. Van Halen back in those days, at least in Florida, would always bring an unsigned band. Bands that you couldn't go out and buy their album. But then again, you wouldn't want to because they were terrible. Maybe that's why Van Halen was just so fucking unbelievable. Bands were too scared to open for them. <clears throat> Randy Rhodes. This is a unique story. Uh, at the time... I was one of them, again, a huge bucket list band of mine was Def Leppard. I I don't like Def Leppard anymore, but that at that time, I owned On Through the Night. Huge fan of On Through the Night. And then High and Dry came out, and I'll never forget, my radio station would say, next we're going to play a brand new song from Def Leppard. I was like, oh my God, Def Leppard got a new album, blah, blah, blah. 
and they played Let It Go. And the first thing I thought of hearing that song, I go, oh my God, they replaced Joe Elliott. Because Joe Elliott sounds nothing like he did on On Through the Night on High and Dry and all the albums after. And I went to that show mainly because I wanted to see Def Leppard. Now, mind you, Ozzy is the singer of my favorite band of all time. I would have went to that show anyway because I love Ozzy, but I was so into Def Leppard at the time. And right before I went to go see the Blizzard of Oz show with Def Leppard, I bought the album Blizzard of Oz and I lived with it. I can't tell you exactly the time frame, but I didn't live with it long enough. I knew, you know, I heard it a few times, loved it. So, back in those days, uh, if you had a ticket on 20th Row, which I did for Ozzy, you'd get white out, a little white out, and you'd white out the zero on the 20th Row, where it only say second row, and you'd wait. I mean, I was a professional at this shit. You'd wait for the lights to go out. Right when the lights go out, you run up to the security guy with the ticket, melee, people are yelling and everything, and... He looks at the ticket with a flashlight real quick. Second row, all right, go. And I went all the way to second row. Then I hopped over to second row on front front row, where front row had a good, like, 10 feet in front of front row. So I was, like, in front of front row with a bunch of people were all crowded up. I was about maybe two, three people uh, behind the guy pressing against the stage. Def Leppard came out, blew my mind. There I am on Pete Willis' side. And they were fucking phenomenal. What a great band that band was. Oh my God. Ten Arm Def Leppard. Woof. Great fucking band. Then Ozzy comes out. Now, I don't know. All I know is Ozzy Osbourne. I don't know his band at all. But there I am. Just like ten feet away from Randy Rhodes. And the vision of that little skinny guy. And they opened the show with I Don't Know. And I'll never forget. He had this cream Les Paul. And he smacked in front of me. And one thing that, I mean, the first impression I got from Randy, I mean, to like a mind-blowing impression was during I Don't Know, There's a there, he does this thing that, you know, n- guitar players use a whammy bar to make that sound. Randy would just bend the fuck out of that that neck of the guitar to get that sound. Like, Whoa. Man, I was like, oh my God, Ozzy. And then all of a sudden I'm looking at this guy going, man, look at this guitar player. And he's smack in front of me, just killing it. And I was like, my God, this guy's a God. This guy's unbelievable. I still didn't know his name. And I'm walking, I mean, yeah, I've got Ozzy's like, you know, on lead guitar, Randy Rhodes. But still, I didn't know who Randy Rhodes was. I learned of his name on that show. And I walked out of that show going, oh my God, that guitar player is amazing. Bought the tour book, still have the Blizzard of Oz tour book. Which, by the way, the Blizzard of Oz tour book has Bob Daisley and Lee Kerslake in it. It's, I guess, the European version, because I know the European tour was the original. But what I saw wasn't. And... um, that was the first time I saw Randy Rhodes. And then after that, I was telling all my buddies about Ozzy's guitar player. This guy is amazing. I wouldn't stop talking about this guitar player that Ozzy has, Randy Rhodes. So the next time Ozzy came down here with Randy Rhodes, it was opening for Foreigner at the Orange Bowl. It was Foreigner, Ozzy, UFO, and I can't remember who else. And uh, I was walking home from school two, three days before that show. And I saw my brother, my, my friend's big brother outside, guy that turned me on to Van Halen. Uh, he goes, hey, Ralph, you heard, dude? I go, what? He goes, Ozzy Osbourne died in a plane crash. Now, at this time, this was the Blizz, uh, Diary of a Madman era. Ozzy was in the news all the time, biting the heads off doves and bats and pissing on the Alamo. And Ozzy was always in the news. So when he told me Ozzy Osbourne died in a plane crash, I didn't believe it. I said, bullshit. It's just another rumor, you know. 
So I go home and uh, eating dinner and the news is on. And it's our news anchor at the time, an elderly lady called Ann Bishop. That I'm sure she's passed away since then. If not, then she must be 150 years old. Said, um, Ozzy Osbourne, that's how she pronounced, pronounced her name, uh, was involved in a, an accident. You know, and then they show like an aerial, aerial view of smoke and fire. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, I thought Ozzy died. And I was freaking out. And then, you know, then they gave a commercial. And I'm glued to the TV going, oh, my God, what happened? What happened? Oh, no, Ozzy died in a plane crash. Then they come back from commercial and said, Ozzy Osbourne, um, there was a plane crash that hit Ozzy's bus. And inside that plane was Ozzy Osbourne's guitar player, Randy Rhodes, who died. And right there, I just looked at the TV and tears were streaming down my face. I was crying. I couldn't believe it. It was surreal to me. It was like I was a young guy. I never experienced death. And I loved Randy Rhodes while he was alive. Whoever out there says that Randy Rhodes uh, became big because if he died, you weren't there. You don't know the impact that guy had before he died. A lot of people were talking about Randy Rhodes before that. Ozzy's guitar player. Right on the heels of Eddie Van Halen. <clears throat> so, I still had tickets to see this Foreigner show. Pat Travers re- replaced Ozzy on the bill. <clears throat> Didn't want to go, but I did. Went to the show. UFO was great. The f- first time I saw UFO. And... um not one mention from any band about Randy. Not one the whole day. Heartbreaking. Pissed me off. And the show was done by 6 p.m. And I that was like the first show I walked out of disappointed. I didn't like Foreigner much. And I like Foreigner. I just thought they weren't that good. Live. Never seen them since. I understand they're really good now. <clears throat> Foreigner 4 tour it was. I walk out of the show and there's a guy outside selling bootleg shirts for foreigner and stuff and he's wearing a diary of a madman shirt and it's the front of the shirt is a picture of that you see in the inner sleeve of diary of a madman which is them sitting on the steps randy rudy tommy and ozzy and i told the guy dude i'll buy that shirt you have on and he's like no no i said i'll give you 20 bucks now 20 bucks back then was like fucking 50, 75 bucks, you know? And the guy's like, okay, 20 bucks. Yeah, fuck yeah. Took that shirt off his back and sold it to me. And um, that shirt's dead and gone. Don't have it anymore. Just like every other shirt back then. Billy Squire. Now, I'm a very casual fan of Billy Squire. I don't hate the guy, but I'm not really a fan either. I mean, he has a couple songs I dig. First time I saw Billy Squire is, oh boy, you talk about Needle and Haystack. It was uh, another one of those baseball stadium shows. I can't remember what. I've seen like several of them, so I can't remember specifically what the lineup was. But Billy Squire was playing one of those shows in the daytime. I only saw Billy Squire twice, and both times something really unique happened at these shows. So the baseball stadium show... Uh, he played his set, and when he was saying bye, you know, I'm in the crowd, just looking up, not paying much attention. All of a sudden, something hits me in the face really hard, busts my lip wide open. Turned out the drummer threw out the drumsticks, and it, out of everybody in a whole fucking stadium, I get hit in the face with a drumstick, busting my lip wide open. The next time I saw Billy Squire, I went because the opening act was Rat. And Rat's first album, Out of the Cellar, I absolutely love to this day. So I went to that show for Rat, not Billy Squire. <clears throat> and here's what happened at that show. Rat was great. Billy Squire, I couldn't tell you if he was great or not because I bumped into a girl 
a very drunk, beautiful girl that seemed to find me extremely attractive. Attractive enough that she wanted to fuck me right there. So we went up to the nosebleeds and I had sex with her during Billy Squire. Now, remember, I'm a teenager, even though I'm still as slutty as I was back then, but whatever. I'll I'll never forget, she was wearing leopard spandex that she had on her knees after I fucked her. She puts her fucking pants on and then she's hanging on me and I'm kind of drunk myself and I'm like, I got me a new chick, man, you know? But she was getting a little obnoxious and drunk and at one time slapped me and started laughing. I was like, well, I don't think that was cool. And... Uh, I'm, I guess I won't mention his name, but a buddy of mine walked up. And this is all during Billy Squire, and he's walking. I mean, we're walking outside. We're not even watching Billy Squire. He's outside as well. What's up, Ralph? What's up, dude? And then she's like, oh, like rubbing on his chest. You're sexy. And I was like, I was like, oh, you like my friend, right? She's like, I want to fuck you. She says to my friend. And I was like, well, all right. So he takes off with her. He probably went back up to the nosebleeds. He had sex with her too. I went in to see Billy Squire. After the show, I see this girl and she doesn't even remember me. And she's like standing where people are exiting. And she's like cussing out everybody as they're walking out. I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. And I walk out and she doesn't even say a word to me, but she's cussing out everybody around me. <clears throat> and she's yelling how she can't find her shoes. And then I see Larry and he's holding her shoes. And he proceeds to throw it in the moat because this was at the sportatorium, which I didn't think was cool, actually. Poor girl, had no shoes. And the sportatorium, the whole parking lot was rocks, gravel, and glass. So... I don't know what happened to her, but yeah, that's my Billy Squires concert story. Ah, Iron Maiden. The first time I ever heard of Iron Maiden was when I walked into the Specs record at the Westside Mall in Hialeah and saw the very first album. And I was like, what the hell is this? Picked it up, turned it around, and holy fuck, they look like Judas Priest. We have Dennis Stratton, the dark hair guitar player wearing red leather pants like Glenn Tipton, Dave Murray with the black vest and all black with blonde hair like K.K. Downing, um, Paul Diano was in all leather short hair like Rob Halford and Steve Harris, like well, he's like UFO, uh, Pete Way from UFO, but I still needed to buy this. I knew this was going to be good. So I heard it, loved it. Then I got Killers when that was new. Number of the Beast when that was new. Oh, Made in Japan when that was new as well. Peace of Mind when that was new. And that was the tour. They finally came to South Florida. Oh my God, do I love me some old school Iron Maiden. So you can just imagine how excited I am to go to this show. Now, before I give my little review, uh, the people at the Rock and Pop, uh, Rock and Metal Combat Podcast, it's so hard to say that fucking podcast. I'm the one that came up with it, and uh, so blame me. Uh, so, a lot of people think I, I'm an Iron Maiden hater because I love Deano, the best era, but I love Bruce Dickinson up to Power Slave and select tracks from just about Every album up to... Well, Book of Souls even had a couple songs I liked. So, um, I just happen to think Judas Priest is way better. But that's a personal opinion. And, um... So, Peace of Mind show comes. I am beyond stoked. This is the day. Finally the day I get to see Iron Maiden. So... Unfortunately, I've never seen him with uh, Deanna or what do you call um, 
Clive Burr. Though I did get to see Paul Deano solo-wise, and I got to meet him, and hopefully, if I remember, I'll say it on this episode. If not, it'll be in part two. Opening act for the Peace of Mind tour was Quiet Riot. Now, at the time, all the line, all the planets aligned for Quiet Riot. It was their time. This is when Metal Health was the rage. Extremely important band uh, that's kicked off... Uh, the, the, the big metal 80s. So they came out. And I you know I love. I love Quiet Riot. Nowhere near as I loved uh, Iron Maiden. Not even close. Iron Maiden to me is. Way above Quiet Riot. It's no brainer. But Quiet Riot came out. And they were amazing. They were really fucking good. You know. And um, thought they'd give a hell of a show. And then it was time for Maiden. Maiden came out and watched them. Left the show thinking, um, that wasn't that good. Now, granted, it could have been an off night. I was pretty close. I took pictures with my little shitty camera, which I will put them up on Vieira Facebook page, which I'm putting up a picture every day of certain shows I've seen throughout the years. But I was disappointed in Iron Maiden. Peace of mind tour. Not really. I guess it was probably an off night. Or maybe the whole tour was that way. But all my friends loved it though. Because you know. there's they, they probably genuinely liked it. But there's a lot of people that refuse to, to say. If one of their favorite bands did a shitty show. Especially if they're your favorite fan. So. I would say it if Black Sabbath did a shitty show, but I've never seen them do a shitty show. But I'm sure they've had off nights. Oh, wait, no, that's not true. I saw Black Sabbath once, and they were terrible because they had that drummer of um, Faith No More, and I didn't like the way he played drums to those Sabbath songs, and Ozzy sounded like shit. So there you go. I can even admit Black Sabbath. Anyway, so uh, the next time Iron Maiden come was the Powered Slave Tour. Opening for Iron Maiden was a band I consider the top three best live band I ever saw in my life. Best band bar none is Van Halen. The next one I would have to say Pantera. Pantera was phenomenal live. And then Twisted Fucking Sister. Yeah, I know some of you. Oh, they wear makeup and they suck. And then, you know, I want to rock. Man, man, man. Yeah, you you never saw Twisted Sister live. And if you said you did, you're lying. If you say they sucked. So here it is. One of the greatest bands opening for Iron Maiden that disappointed me the last time I saw them. So I was telling all my buddies, oh man, Twisted Sister's going to destroy Iron Maiden. All my buddies are like, you're an idiot. <laughs> right? I go, oh, you'll see. You'll see. So Twisted Sister comes out blazing. They were sounding great. They were great. But then, some Iron Maiden fan, I wasn't, I had like maybe 13th row. So I didn't see exactly what this person was doing all the way up front. But he was fucking with D. Snyder. And D. Snyder stopped the show, wanted to fight him. Melee went out for about, I don't know, Five minutes, they could have played another song, and D. Snyder was too busy screaming at some guy, and then dropping the mic and screaming at him without the mic, and it was just terrible. And then uh, they played a song. Then JJ, at that time, the single was "The Price," and JJ went up to the microphone and said, "Hey, look, unfortunately, we can't play the Price tonight," and the whole place booed. And I'm like, "Why would you even mention that? Just don't play it, you know." I thought Twist Sister was not that good that night. So I was like, damn, right? Then Iron Maiden comes out. The whole Power Slave production. They were fucking mind-blowing, amazing, destroyed Twisted Sister that night. One of my favorite bands got destroyed by Iron Maiden. And that night it was the mighty Iron Maiden. Because that was the best fucking time I ever saw Iron Maiden. They were so great. They were so on fire. They were just unbelievable. And um, 
I got to say, Bruce Dickinson sounded great that night. If you ask me, I think they should have used that night and fucking filmed it and recorded it and released that as Live After Death because I'm sorry, man. It's Live After Death. The band sounds amazing, but Bruce sounds like ass. That's my opinion. I think so. But I think in the sportatorium, he sounded fucking great. So I would have taken that that over the Live After Death. Any day. Well, my favorite live album with Bruce Dickinson is Beast Over Hammersmith. Love it. So that's my Iron Maiden story. And I saw Iron Maiden. I've never missed an Iron Maiden show in South Florida. I've seen, what was the album after that? Somewhere in Time. I believe that was with Ingve Malmsteen. Then Seven Son of a Seven Son. Can't remember who opened that one. I think it was Dogs Lamar or something like that. Uh, no Prayer for the Dying was canceled. It was supposed to be at the Miami Arena, but they canceled it. Uh, I, I believe it was due to Bruce's voice, but the rumor also was they didn't sell enough tickets. <laughs> then I saw, and this, you know, these are all huge hen- venues. Then I saw the Fear of the Dark tour at the Sunrise Musical Theater, very scaled down with Testament and Corrosion of Conformity. Then after that, I saw The X Factor at R- Club Revolution. Club Revolution is a smaller, very small theater. Let me put it this way. I played there. Thrasher and Eyes played Revolution. So Then I saw the um, Somewhere Back in Time. Now, you got to remember, like Iron Maiden, for the longest time after that Revolution show, wouldn't come to South Florida. They did many tours after that, and they wouldn't come down here. They've, and Nico lives down here. Which, by the way, I want to give a plug to Nico's Rock and Roll Ribs. The best fucking ribs ever is at that place. You need to go there. Memorabilia of Iron Maiden everywhere. It's fucking awesome. But the next time they came after the X Factor was, uh, I believe it was called Somewhere Back in Time. No, was it? it you know, they, they had the Power Slave st- stage back and all they did was play the old school stuff. That was fucking great. And then I saw the Final Frontier Tour and then the last one, Book of Souls. So I've seen Iron Maiden. I've never missed an Iron Maiden show in South Florida. The Oz year bus. This is something very unique uh, in my youth. And this has to do with concerts, but I got to build it up. Uh, when I was, uh, I don't know, mid-teens, early teens, my parents went on vacation and my brother and I decided to throw a party. So this we had such a killer party. I still have pictures of it that we actually had a band play my house that's how crazy our party was we set up band set up in the back back of the fucking uh in the backyard and uh i had a bunch of my friends come by and my friend knew a guy called sal i never met sal before and to this day sal's my hero uh he invited sal to come by and a group called the oz years now the oz years were just you know a bunch of fucking ozzy fans and they owned a yellow bus, a yellow school bus. I mean, one of the big buses. And this fucking bus comes pulling up in front of my house, spray paint all over it. It says the Oz years, Ozzy, Black Sabbath, you know, all the bands at the time, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. Comes out a pile of fucking metalheads, invade my house. And I was like, whoa, look at these dudes. You know, I've never met any of them. And they were all fucking cool. And they had this big white dog. And these guys were fucking insane. And during the night, uh, they, this guy had this big white dog. With like, you know, those big dogs, shaggy dogs. And this dude was fucked up. And, you know, he was like, he got perfume. And he's like, 2% alcohol. And the fucker downs it. And I was like, whoa, man. And he soon passed out with a cigarette in his mouth. Lit and his head on the shaggy dog as a pillow. And he turned his head in his sleep with the cigarette still lit in his mouth and he burned the dog. The dog jumped up and his head hit the, it was a tile floor. And he was like, whoa, man. And luckily he didn't break his head, but he did get a big ass lump on his head. And there were like Oz Oz ears hanging. We had trees in the back and they're all hanging off trees and laying on branches. It was just, a fucking melee. Anyway, it was such a cool party that the Oz made me an Oz 
and they would take me to shows. And the first show that we went on the Aussiers, oh, I got to bring up Sal. The, he's the leader of the Aussiers, the guy that drove the bus. The guy was one bad motherfucker. I saw him three kick three people's ass at the same time. Three people jumped him and he kicked all their asses. The guy was a god. I'll never forget when he came to my house and he looked through my records and he saw Jesus Priest on Lisa and he says, hey, hey, Ralph, can I borrow it? I was like, whoa, dude, it'd be my honor. You know, I was just in awe of this dude. Anyway, so Sal went early one day when Ozzy was coming to town to, uh, with Motley Crue. It was the Bark of the Moon Shot of the Devil tour. And Sal bought the whole first row on like the first. I mean, he was there in the beginning and he got first row for everybody in the odds here. He, he, you know, we had to pay him, but he still bought the whole fucking first row. So all of us had front row seats for Motley Crue and Ozzy Osbourne. And that was a phenomenal show. Ozzy was... See, I saw Ozzy two times before that. Randy Rhodes, Blizzard of Oz tour, and then I saw the Speak of the Devil tour. Which was with Jakey Lee, by the way, not Brad Gillis. And that was... I think Ozzy sounded the best. I mean, back then in the 80s, on the Bark of the Moon tour. He was on fire. You'd figure he would have been all fucked up mess with the stories you heard about it. Motley Crue is phenomenal, and a cool story about the Motley Crue thing is that they had a record signing in Fort Lauderdale that I went to at a Peaches. So I went there, and I got uh, Nikki Six to sign the album and Mick Mars as well, but you can, you can only get one signature from each member, and I ended up getting two, but I never got Vince Neil or Tommy Lee. So I met Vince Neil like... 20 somewhat years later at a strip club he he was at a grand opening of a strip club I don't go to strip clubs I really don't I don't believe in that shit uh, I don't believe like giving girls money to get naked in front of me unless I'm doing more after that and 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 I'm still not giving them money I, I mean we all have to pay in one way or another like movies beer fucking food whatever but I went to that so I got him to sign it so my last autograph was Tommy Lee now, Tommy Lee, I got about 30 years later. He came to uh, South Beach. He played a show at uh, Billboard Live, which is no longer there. And it was that terrible, what is it? Uh, no, not a dull moment shit. And I took my album to the show, hoping I could meet him, not knowing if I could. And then I noticed uh, if you bought a CD, you get to meet Tommy Lee. So if you bought the new CDs, I said, fuck it. There you go. That's my ticket. So I bought the CD. So I told him, I said, dude, it took me 30 years to get everybody to sign his fucking album. And he said, you aced it, dude. And he was really cool. And I took a picture with him. This was before he stopped taking pictures with anybody. So I got him right in time. So speaking of 30 years later, at that Peaches signing, I uh, I don't remember doing this, but there was a picture taken of a group of us outside of the Peaches and somebody holding a big banner. And I'm standing there with my Shout Out the Devil album, holding it up. And 30 years later, my buddy, David Lovett, on uh, Facebook, showed me the picture. He said, hey, Ralph, is that you? And what's funny is that picture was taken from a Facebook in Los Angeles. But they had that, that picture from the Fort Lauderdale signing. And I was like, oh, my God. I don't remember taking that picture. But then again, it's 30 fucking years ago. But that's fucking wild how... I, I have that picture now. What a glorious time to be alive. What a glorious time to be a teenager in the roaring 80s during the arena rock shows. And uh, But then that all died down with grunge. But a lot of people look at the grunge years as terrible years, but not me. I think it was a glorious time. It was a special time because I went to go see Ronnie James Dio in a little club. I went to go see Judas Priest in a little club, same little club button south i saw iron maiden in a bigger kind of like a, a you know a two-floor club it was bigger than that place i'd say about almost double the size of a club and neither one of them was sold out but the special thing about it was everybody that was at those shows were fucking metal and still holding on to metal you know these are bands that played fucking arenas with what, you know, 15, 16,000 people, 20,000 people. And here I am seeing them in a, in a club to like just a few hundred, if that, you know. And um, 
But it was special because we were all there and we all never forgot and we all held on to the medal. It wasn't until like the 2000s I started to see some of the people I used to see at arena shows start showing up to like Iron Maiden when they were playing arenas and Judas Priest when they played the big hard rock place. And and don't think I didn't go up to them because they're, hey, Ralph, no long time, no see. I go, yeah, that's right, because you wouldn't go, you wouldn't support metal in the 90s or else you would have seen me. Uh, Creatures of the Night Tour. I should talk about that. Uh, the Kiss tour with uh, Vinny Vincent. That was the first time I saw Kiss. And on the drive over there, they announced on the radio that Ace Fairley won't be here because he got in a car accident and Vinny Vincent's filling in. And I was super pissed off because Ace Fairley is my favorite member of him, of Kiss. But man, I went there and the plasmatics opened up. That was fucking jaw dropping, life changing for me too. Because I didn't really know much about the Plasmatics. I know they got a lot of press, but I never really heard their music. And that was a Coupe de Ta tour. And uh, man, they were so great. I ran out and bought that album. And to this day, the Plasmatics Coupe de Ta is definitely in my top 10 favorite albums of all time. And then Kiss came out. I was kind of pissed. Not kind of. I was very pissed that Ace really wasn't going to be there. And here comes this fucking guy with Ankh makeup on and he proceeded to fucking blow my mind. He was so good. Kiss was so good. And it was a half-empty arena. But that was a great, great show with the big tank and stuff. And then when I saw Lick It Up Tour a year later, they still had the same stage. And it was in an arena and it was much more packed because now people like Kiss again because they took off their makeup. I know, strange, right? Los Angeles, 1985. You want to talk about the height of the Sunset Strip and the whiskey and the Troubadour and Country Club. Went to all those places in 1985. And I saw many bands. I also went to the LA Forum. I saw ACDC with Yngwie uh, open up. Fly the Wall tour. And I believe his was uh, either Trilogy or Marching Out. I'm a little hazy on that one. I think it was uh, Marching Out. But anyway... Oddly enough, the Marching Out tour had Mark Bowles singing, the singer from Trilogy. And then when I saw Yngwie open for Iron Maiden on the, what was it, uh, the Trilogy tour, it was Mark St. John from the Marching Out album. It was a flip-flop. But the most interesting thing I saw in retrospect at the visit of uh, being in L.A., was going to the Troubadour on a Wednesday night. And I was with my friend Henry Saria, who is still my buddy. He's on my Facebook, and he still lives in Los Angeles to this day. And this is 1985, October of 1985. We went to the Troubadour, and we got up to the door, and we said to the guy, hey, who's playing tonight? And he said, Guns and Roses. And I was like, wow, that's a weird name for a band. Now, this is two years prior uh, from Appetite for Destruction. So I did see Guns N' Roses back in two years, you know, before they released an album. And I got to tell you, I mean, I, I left the club going, yeah, they were good. You know, I, I, I had a good time. You know, they they reminded me, you know, all I remember about that show was they played uh, Mama Kin from uh, Aerosmith. I don't, they could have played Welcome to the Jungle and all the, well-known songs now, but I wouldn't have known back then. I don't remember if they did or not, but I'm sure they must have played some of Appetite that night. But I also saw a lot of other shows that I, I liked more. You know, I saw like the ACDC show, Odin, who is a joke now because of the decline of Western civilization. But uh, I saw Odin at the country club with a band called Stone Soldier. Now, here's the funny thing about Stone Soldier. Uh, I was, um, before I got my city job, I was delivering Chinese food. And one day I was wearing an armored saint shirt, delivering Chinese food. And I delivered Chinese food to this one guy. And he said, oh man, armored saint, man. Yeah, man. You know, I, I played gigs with those guys. My band used to open for them in California. And I was like, oh yeah, what was the name of your band? Stone soldier. I was like, oh my God, dude, I saw you guys open for Odin. You know, what a weird, you know, coincidence that is. But uh, Odin was great, man. Uh, I have that EP, uh, Don't Take No for an Answer. 
doesn't sound like that shit you see in Decline. I thought they were a great fucking band. And, um, yeah, Jeff Duncan now in Armored Saint. Cool guy. I interviewed him, and maybe I'll play that on a future Vieira Vault. The Cameo Theater, Miami Beach, just blocks away from my house, was the mecca of thrash metal shows. First show there ever was uh, Nasty Savage, amazing band. And uh, I'm at this Nasty Savage show, and while I'm leaving, and a guy's announcing on the PA, oh, upcoming shows, Megadeth. I was like, whoa, Megadeth, Peace Sells Tour. Two nights. I went both nights to see Megadeth. It was uh, Friday and Saturday night at the Cameo, and neither one of those nights they played Black Friday, my favorite song from that album. And uh, King Diamond, that was historic because Merciful Fate to me is my favorite band my favorite metal band of the 80s to actually see King Diamond and be so close and touch his boot was fucking amazing oh who else played there Slayer with Motorhead and Overkill Violence Destruction Crow Mags oh man I can go on and on there was so many great shows Death Death Angel Exodus Testament with Anthrax, then te- then Anthrax came back with uh, Anthrax, Exodus, and Celtic Frost into the Pandemonium tour. A lot of great, great, great thrash shows I saw at that place. And then, uh, but I got to tell you, the very first time I was ever in a pit because I was afraid of mosh pits. Now, the first time I ever seen a pit was when I was really young. There used to be a club on Miami Beach called Flynn's. And we used to sneak in there and they used to have punk rock shows, hardcore shows, punk rock. And uh, I'll never forget seeing my first, the slam dance. And man, that made mosh pits today look like shit because that was just a bunch of people punching each other in the face. And I was like, what the fuck? It looked like a ballroom brawl. That's how it was. And I was just petrified of mosh pits. And even at the cameo, I wouldn't go near a pit. Till I, by default, got stuck in a mosh pit. And this was the Monsters of Rock Tour at the Orange Bowl, which was Kingdom Come, Metallica, Dokken, Scorpions, and Van Hagar. And I'm all the way up front because I have never seen Metallica yet. And unfortunately, I've never seen them with Cliff Burton. This was before Justice came out. They did play Harvester of Sorrow that day. Kingdom Come came out. They were terrible. Then Metallica came on. I'm all the way up front. And when they came out, the biggest pit that I was ever in at that time broke out. And I had no choice. I had to like mosh around and, you know, or else I'd get slaughtered, you know. So you had to move with the crowd. And I didn't want to leave my spot. I didn't want to run out of the pit because I wanted to see Metallica that bad. And all of a sudden, I'm moshing around in Metallica, and I'm thinking, holy fuck, I love this. This is fun. And I became addicted to mosh pits till now. I am too old to do it. But I still jump in here and there. Like, if I ever go see Slayer, it's like, even when I see Slayer now, I'm like, all right, I'm not going to get in the pit during Rain and Blood. No way, no way. But, you know, once that, then, 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 my body's going, Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And then when it goes, when it just goes into always in the pit, never fails. I always jump in a mosh pit for rain and blood, even to today. Back then, I was much thinner, so I used to stage dive a lot. There is a video, I believe it's on YouTube, of Death on the Leprosy Tour. You see me stage dive a couple times on that. And uh, got a lot of injuries, got my lip busted. I, I've noticed. All my injuries in mosh pits weren't really from moshing. They were from stage divers. I would always like get hit by a stage diver. And I remember Flotsam and Jetsam broke my lip wide open, even wider than Billy Squire's drummer did when he threw that, that drumstick. And, you know, I've had bloody noses, sprained ankles, you name it. But it was all worth it. You know, a lot of people think, oh, man. That's so stupid, mosh pits. Yeah, but then these same people play tackle football, and I really don't see a difference. Except, you know, with tackle football, you don't have the killer metal blurring, blurring 
or blasting while you're playing football, unless you're one cool motherfucker that got a bunch of cool motherfuckers friends. That's a good damn idea. Metal football. So I pretty much covered the 80s as much as I could. I know I'm leaving out a lot of good stuff, and I'm sure after I'm done with this episode, I'm, I can't believe I didn't mention that show. But that happens to all of us. Well, now let's go into the 90s. And for me, the greatest band live in the 90s, hands down, was Pan Fucking Terra. Yeah, yeah, I know some of you listening are like, I fucking hate Pantera. I know it's trendy to hate him. Oh, this guy likes Pantera. I'm going to stop listening. Well, if you're going to stop listening, I'll, before you before you turn it off, I got something to say. I got something to say. Thank you and fuck off. Pantera, to me, saved fucking metal during the, the dark years. Every time I saw Pantera live, Phil would say it. We fly the flag of metal. Fuck alternative. We are the alternative now. Because everything blew up. And I, I'm not a grunge hater. I liked Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, and even Nirvana, the poppier Nirvana songs. When they went all alternative, I couldn't get into it. I didn't like Bleach, you know, the one everybody likes. I liked the trendy one. Never mind. I love that album. And I like most of Insecticide. But the one after that, whatever. But this ain't about grunge. Which I had my share of grunge. But it's about Pan fucking Terra. They were so amazing live. Phil Anselmo is definitely up there with David Lee Roth and Dee Snyder as my favorite front men. They had that vibe, that stage presence that was just, you either had it or you didn't. You know, people talk about Paul Stanley. No, man. I don't really understand. Paul Stanley, I think, is a great performer. But his stage raps are fucking terrible. I'm sorry. But man, the, the 80s was fucking terrible. He would spend 10 minutes talking about a nurse giving him head. And he was just so desperately trying to be David Lee Roth. And he's no better now with his stupid sermons. Like he's a rock and roll preacher. It's just bothers me to no end. If you want to hear some real fucking cringeworthy shit, get on YouTube. Some guy made a compilation called Let Me Get This Off My Chest, Paul Stanley where he just compiled a bunch of his stage raps and it's, just, oh my God, I don't get it. And a lot of people are like, he's the best front man. Yeah, well, these people never saw fucking David Lee Roth in 1981, let me tell you. D- Paul Stanley did, and then he tried to be him. But Pantera, man, every single time I saw Pantera, every single time, they were amazing. I never seen a band destroy a headliner than Pantera did to Skid Row. And I like Skid Row. I wasn't really a fan of the first album, but Slave to the Grind, excellent album. So I went to go see Pantera and Skid Row and Pantera just destroyed them. Badly. What was unique about that show, there was, um, they played Whiplash with Phil on guitar and Dime singing it. What a great, great fucking band. And to me, they were Stronger than all. And yeah, I have a lot of arguments. The original lineup of Thrasher Die, I was the only person in that band that liked Pantera. I got a lot of shit for it. Uh, I had one member even to tell me, man, I'm ashamed to be your friend since you like Pantera. And I just looked at him and I said, you're a fucking idiot. You are such a fuck boy. Get the fuck out of my face with your stupid bullshit. Go listen to your Beherit. Yeah, yeah, Beherit. All you hardcores out there that love Beherit and you hate Pantera, well, now I know how you feel because I feel the same way about Beherit. But the first wave of death metal I absolutely loved and still do. The late 80s, early 90s death metal, like my favorite, hands down, is Morbid Angel. Those first four albums, I just... It's up to Covenant, but I love Domination. I like Gateways. I love I love Formulas of the Flesh. Shit, I like Formulas even more than Domination. But that hands down is my favorite. I love the early Obituary. The I just got an idea. Um, also, um, oh, God damn it! Now you gave me a brain fart idea. <laughs> um, <clears throat> obituary Deicide. Deicide is a great great band. Uh, Legions. Wow. Great fucking album. Um, 
who else am I missing out? I mentioned death. Death was my first experience. I didn't get it at first. I didn't hear scream bloody gore uh, first. I heard um, leprosy. My friend Holy George lent me the cassette and I listened to it and I was like, I don't get it. And then I listened to it a couple more times and I was like, uh, I'm starting to get it. And to this day, Leprosy is my favorite death album. I liked later death. I didn't like Sound of Perseverance, but I, did, I didn't I did mind when they got technical and symbolic and human and individual thought patterns. I thought they were good albums, but yeah, the first three are my favorite. Up to Spiritual Healing, Human's great, but those first three, the ugly, dirty death stuff, you know? So, uh, but to tell you the truth, I am not really a death metal fan. I just like that early stuff. I didn't really get into, uh, you know, there are exceptions. I like the band called The Chasm. Uh, I believe they were from Mexico. Um, Christian was a cool band. Uh, but that's pretty much it. You know, I mean, I can't really get into Nile. I mean, I, I, I liked them kind of like up till Black, um, oh, what's the name of that? Uh, something Seeds of Vengeance. Now I can't, I can't remember the name but they're just so pummeling live. And, you know, the blast beat was so special back in the day. You would hear a song and then a little blast beat will come out. And you're like, whoa, that's fucking sick. But now it's like a whole fucking song with blast beat. It's like, <sighs> I can't catch my breath. And Niall is infamous f- for like me, like just like totally out of breath. So, and yeah, most of my South Florida metal friends are really into death metal. Uh, there is a local band called Corodia, which I love because they 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 have that old school death metal sound that I really love. So uh, you know there are exceptions. You know I really did like them, but um, that's as far as the death metal I go. I kind of like am stagnated. But you got to also remember I'm so old school, you know, and I I, I got into like music in the seventies. So there's not a lot of people my age that are into death metal like you know. Most people my age never even got past the Scorpions. Never even got into Thrash, you know. So you got to give me a little credit there. There is a lot of the newer death metal bands, like, uh, you know, that I can appreciate live, but I can't, like, sit home and listen to it. Like, uh, something that's not death metal that I've seen videos of, and I'm like, you know, I can't sit here and listen to this, but I think I would really enjoy seeing it live would be a Transberia orchestra. I love musicians. You know, I like to see like, you know, Victor Wooten, Buckethead. I love watching that stuff live. Sometimes I'm in the mood. I have to be in a special mood for being, because I do own some of that stuff on vinyl that I'll put it on. Al Demiola and uh, the late, great uh, Alan Holsworth. You know, I, I do like I owe you. I, probably the one I play the most out of everybody. Uh, some Jocko Pistoria. I mean, it's stuff that, you know, unfortunately I've never seen Jocko, but it's, I, I do love technical great players and jazz fusion and shit, but it's not something I listen to at home. And I, I feel the same way about death metal. You know, it's like a lot of death metal. I like to see live, but I don't like to kick back at home, but I did take, talk about, uh, TSO earlier, which is a spawn of sabotage, and that's something I haven't brought up. And now I'm going to dip back to the 80s, but also the 90s, and talk about the great band Sabotage, who never really got their due. But I'm glad now, you know, the the spirit of Sabotage with Paul O'Neill, who's very responsible for, you know, Hall of the Mountain King and stuff, get his due, even though he just passed away. But, you know, you have Chris Cafferty, and I'm sure John Oliva has something to do with it. But they were like a club band down here in South Florida. And I saw them. And man, let me tell you, I love Nuclear Assault. Love them. But they demolished Nuclear Assault. I saw them play with Nuclear Assault once. It was Testament, Nuclear Assault, and Sabotage. But Testament canceled. And uh, man, that was no match. And I met Chris Oliva on more than one occasion. I saw Sabotage open for Dio and Megadeth. And I saw him various times in clubs. I saw him two nights at Summers on the Beach with Annihilator opening. Allison Hell Tour with Randy Rampage on vocals. That was mind-blowing. But I want to talk about the last time I saw Sabotage. It was the Button South. And Chris Oliva was kind of like a, 
I don't know, I, I figure like a Randy Rhodes type of person because, you know, Randy Rhodes is known as like the quiet guy. And that's how Chris Oliva was. So I met him several times. And then the last time I met him was uh, Edge of Thorns tour at the Button South. And he was in the back and I had him sign my thing. And I said, you know, Chris, I know you, you probably think I'm saying this because I just met you, but I think you're one of the greatest guitar players ever. And he's definitely in my top 10. What an amazing guitar player he was. And I said, and then he told me, yeah, right. You're just saying that because you met me. But, you know, he said it in a little sarcastic, humorous way. Then he thanked me. And then they played live. And this is John Oliva is no longer in the band. Zach Stevens is their singer. And when they ended their set, I saw Chris Oliva do something I'd never seen him do before. And plus, he was kind of like, he had stubble. You know, he was always clean shaven. But that night, he had kind of like a stubbly face. And he grabbed the microphone. He's like, yeah, fuck yeah. Thanks for coming out. And I was like, wow, that's out of character for him. And that show was on a Friday night. Not sure if they played the next night. But on Sunday, I'll never forget, I was watching The Simpsons at my house. And I got a call from my friend Carlos Guti. And he said, did you hear? I said, no, what? He goes, Chris Oliva died in a car accident. And I was like, that can't, I just saw him two days ago. It's always so surreal, you know, when you find out somebody died, especially if you were just hanging out with them. So, yeah, so, and I've seen Sabotage a bunch of times and boy, I'm very happy I did because Sabotage was a very, very extremely special band for me back in the day. And all hail Chris Oliva, man. He's awesome. So is John Oliva. John Oliva. Uh, is an awesome guy too. I met him on several occasions. Very cool dude. I've always had great experiences meeting people. Uh, and I have never really had a bad experience. I mean, yeah, one time John Oliva, who's also always cool, uh, ran out of a club one night, pissed off about something. And I said, uh, and then, you know, s- some people stopped and get an autograph. And then I joined in. And I said, uh, John, uh, what's up with the live album? Because, you know, I read a live album was coming out. And he just looked at me and goes, yeah, what's up with the live album? And I was like, whoa. So I think that was like the only bad experience. No, that's not true. I had a really bad experience with Gary Holt of uh, Exodus. Who I've met since, but it was the first time I met him. He was kind of a dick. But afterwards, when I met him way later, like 10 or so years later, he was super cool. But this was uh, Impact is Imminent Tour. They were playing with Body Count and DRI. And um, I had all the CDs, you know, to sign. And he signed them all. Then he walked in and then he came out with a handful of picks, guitar picks. He's like, oh, man, Gary Gary can have a pick. And he's like, no, they're for him. They gave it to this fucking dude there. He gave like a handful of picks. He couldn't afford to give me a pick. I own all your fucking albums and you can't give me just one measly guitar pick. And I just thought that was a very dickish thing. But their bass player at the time, I can't remember his last name, Rob, was super cool. Oh, and Steve Souza. I met him a few times. That guy's super cool. Oh, man. D. Snyder was cool. Ozzy was super cool. Oh, I got to tell my Ozzy story. This is a great, great story. I met Ozzy Osbourne with no fans around. And how did I do this was, this was uh, on the beach, on Miami Beach, there was a Spanish MTV. Latin MTV used to uh, be filmed here on the beach. And I had a friend that was friends with the cameraman and he told me Ozzy was going to be there uh, on a Friday. So I went like at 2 p.m. on a Friday. So I showed up and the host of the that it's Latin MTV was this really cool guy. I can't remember his la- name. Spanish dude with long hair. And he took a liking to me right when I got there. He's like, hey, how you doing? I had the Aussie shirt. I had a couple Aussie things to get signed. You know, I, and uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, Aussie will be here soon. Yeah. Hey, you want to come in when I interview him? I'm like, yeah, dude. So I'm sitting in the office and the office was like, there was a hallway outside of the office with glass doors. And I saw Ozzy walk by with his assistant, Tony. And I was, and he just walked right by it. And I was like, oh shit, there's Ozzy. And then I, I walked out and Ozzy and Tony were looking and looking around. And I just go, Ozzy, it's over here. And he turned around and came in. I didn't bother Ozzy. I figured I'll ask for an autograph when it's, you know, when he's done with his interview. So 
uh, we sat down. This was before Osmosis came out, and I'm sitting there watching Ozzy. And while Ozzy's being interviewed, which I have on video, uh, Ozzy talked about his new guitar player, Joe Holmes, was which was uh, a student of Randy Rhodes. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool, you know? And uh, then there were certain t- parts of the interview where Ozzy would say like something funny and he'd always look right at me and laugh. And it was just, I don't know, it was just mind blowing. And then the interview was over and they took him into like a little green room and I'm just hanging out outside the room with the, with the records. And the, the host of the show is so cool. He's like, come here. And he goes, what's your name, Ralph? And he goes, Ozzy, I want you to meet my friend Ralph. And Ozzy's like, hey, how you doing? I, I'm sure Ozzy's like, there's no fans around, so he gave me a good amount of attention. And he even patted the couch he was sitting in and said, sit down, sit down, Ralph. And he signed all my stuff. And I said to him, Ozzy, were you in a band called Magic Lantern? Because there's a friend of mine that his father-in-law bought him a bunch of used records. And one of the records was his band from the 60s called Magic Lantern, where the guy was a dead ringer for Ozzy. And his name was Ozzy Osbourne. Or John Osborne. I can't remember. So I said that to him and he said, no, 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 no. It's another bloke called Ozzy Osbourne. I know the band you're talking about. And he's like, yeah, I haven't heard that in a long time. Magic Lantern. Yeah. I remember back in the day, people thought I was him. And that was it. I didn't want to take up Ozzy's time. I said, thank you, Ozzy. And oh man, I I wish I can think of it. I've met many, 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 many bands. Tons. Too many to uh, list, but I got to tell you, out of every person I met, by far the greatest, this is like, not only like the nicest rock star I ever met, but like just the nicest person, period. And I met him twice. It was Mr. Ronnie James Dio. Oh man, was that amazing meeting him. He was so cool. The first time I met him was Strange Highways, uh, played a little tiny club. So appreciative of his fans. Talked to me, asked me questions. I told him how much I loved Rainbow Eyes. And he's like, oh, I love that song. And, you know, I talked about Blackmore and Rainbow. And, you know, he was cool about it. He said, I don't think it'll ever happen again, you know. But then the second time I met him was the Magicka tour. And that's when I finally got a picture with him. But I just want to hail Ronnie James Dio. What an amazing, amazing performer. One of my favorite voices. Greatest song of all time, in my opinion, Stargazer. And just the nicest guy I've ever met, ever, in any band. And let me tell you, I've never had a bad experience with any member except, you know, those two I mentioned. Oh, and Lemmy, too, was super, super cool. Uh, The situation with Lemmy was pretty funny. Um, It was uh, the 1916 tour. They were playing the Button South with... Metal Church and Dangerous Toys. So I'm in the back and I have uh, my rock and roll album for him to sign. I had everybody sign it. They were all cool. Even Filthy Animal who, you know, wouldn't sign a drumstick. He threw out a drumstick. I caught it, but it didn't say Filthy Animal on it. And I was like, Filthy, can you drum? And he's like, I don't sign drumsticks. You know, I'll sign anything else, bloke. You know, it was kind of. Oh man, then okay, you know, he was nice. He just didn't, he just didn't sign guitar, uh, drumsticks. So what? Big deal. But he was super cool. Wurzel, <laughs> that guy, may he rest in peace, he shook my hand so hard, he hurt my hand. For days, my hand hurt. But, you know, he shook it like, oh, how you doing, mate? You know, he was a super nice guy, you know. Talked to us for a while. There was a group of us out there. All my buddies are hanging out. Phil Campbell is okay. Then Lemmy comes out. Now, before Lemmy came out, the, the backstage door opened and I saw Lemmy with this really hot chick with Daisy Dukes on and he had her hand, his hand on her ass. Then the, the door closed. I was like, dude, there's Lemmy. There's Lemmy. He's going to come out soon, you know? And then here comes Lemmy. He comes walking out with that hot chick and another hot chick. He had two hot chicks. And he's walking toward the tour bus with them. And we stopped him. And I know, look, I don't want to take up Lemmy's time because he's got two hot chicks. He's about to get down. But he didn't give a fuck. That's how cool he fucking was. He's like, fuck it. I'll, I'll fuck him when I fuck him. 
Here's my fucking, here's people that love my band. I'm going to spend time with them. And he did. He sat there and talked to us for a while. And I said to Lemmy, I maybe said this before, because here's the thing. I'm doing this show in splurts. It's like, I've started this show days ago. I'm just, as I remember stories, I press play and I start talking. So I may have said this story already where I told Lemmy, one of the things I told Lemmy was, uh, I saw your very first show in the U S and he said, no, I've been here with Hawkwin. But, uh, and, uh, I was so deaf cause I wasn't wearing earplugs at that show. So my ears were ringing severely. And a guy told Lemmy, what do you think of, uh, Sepultura's version of Orgasmatron, which I personally fucking love. I love that version, but I don't think Lemmy did, but I wish I knew what he told the guy. He looked disgusted and he was like, bah, 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 and I couldn't make it out cause I was half deaf. And then, you know, he kept talking to us and uh, he was telling us stories and, you know, telling, you know, telling us about the tour they're on, the Operation Rock and Roll with Alice Cooper and Judas Priest, which was broken in half because that part played up north and they brought this down. Super cool guy. But the conversation ended when my friend Paul said to him, Lemmy, Seasons of the Witch rules. And then Lemmy said, what? And he goes, Sam Cole Powell. Now, Zam Cole Powell, you can see it on YouTube, was some band that Lemmy was in in the 60s. And it was like, I think it was like a flute play. Zam Cole Powell played the flute. And it was a trio, I believe. And uh, Lemmy just looked at him like, ew. Like, he's like, well, somebody's got to like it. And then he grabbed his girls and left. I don't think he liked that. (laughs) So that's my Lemmy story. I did see Lemmy one more time on the motorboat, but that was... You know, a little photo shoot. And I took that, you know, I took a picture of him. Same thing with Ozzy. When I met Ozzy that day I told you about, I didn't take a camera or anything. I just took shit to get signed. Because back then, autographs meant everything to me. Now it's like, I don't give a fuck out about autographs. I want to get pictures with people. And Ozzy, after that MTV interview, was taking pictures with the staff and choking them, like making funny faces. And I was like, God, I wish I had a camera. So it was my mission to get a picture with Ozzy. And I spent... $2,000 $2,000 to meet Ozzy Osbourne on VIP. It was a thousand bucks a piece. My ex-girlfriend at the time, her favorite band ever. I mean, favorite person ever is Ozzy. So as a present to her, I bought her, uh, I bought her a VIP for Christmas and I bought myself one as well. I said, fuck it. Now I get to pick a picture with Ozzy. And I know some of you are saying, fuck $2,000 is too much. That's because you're a cheap bastard or get a better job. I got a job where I can blow 2000 bucks on VIP and still still pay my rent, still make ends meet. So, fuck it. I ain't going to die. Uh, they're not going to put all the money in my fucking coffin when I die. You know, what am I going to do with it when I die? Fucking spend it and just save too. You know, I, the trick is if you save your money correctly and you got enough money in the bank to make ends meet, why not uh, blow money on VIP? And anybody out there that says... Oh, bands are ripping fans off. No, they're not. No band is putting a gun to anybody's head to do it. If I can meet a band on VIP, hey man, I'll do it in a heartbeat. And plus, I am helping them financially, you know? So I'm happy. Well, Ozzy, I'm not really helping financially. But, you know, I played VIP for for Armored Saint and Behemoth and Cannibal Corpse. I I paid VIP for many bands. um, Well, not Ace Frehley, but I was VIP with Ace Frehley. Anyway, so... um, I got my picture with Ozzy. That was my whole deal. So, you know, there was a lot of people back in the day I wish I would have taken a picture with, like Ray Gillen. I met him. Super nice guy, too. So I think I covered enough. I know I'm leaving a lot of killer stories out. Oh, I want to end it with this. One of my top favorite shows, too, was a Kiss Reunion in Madison Square Garden. My friend Eve had skybox seats. We went to three of the four shows, and there was just something so electric about that Madison Square Garden show. Because I have yet I have seen it again in Miami Arena when it came down here. I saw it again and it was amazing. But it wasn't like the Madison Square Garden. There was electricity in the air. So that man, my top five shows, I probably have to do a, another episode, but I'll, off the top of my head, Van Halen Fair Warning, Kiss Madison Square Garden, uh, Merciful Fate, The Edge, Fort Lauderdale, uh, SOD up in Orlando. 
and uh, Pantera. Name, name a show. But um, the reason why I'm ending this show now, because I want to dig into the Vieira Vault, and this is a kind of long interview of the very first time I saw Van Halen. They did um, an interview for WSHE, and it is an insane interview. It's off the wall, and I want to end it with this, and then I'll come back and say my goodbyes. So this is Van Halen, 1981, in the radio studios WSHE. It was 1980, not 81. Women and Children First Tour. Cellador Concert presents Van Halen. Van Halen in concert at the Hollywood Sportatorium tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Van Halen with high energy rock and roll. Tickets are $9, reserved plus a service fee. It includes parking. No cameras or recording devices are allowed in the Sportatorium. Come on out and rock to the sounds of Van Halen in concert with special guests, Caps, at the Hollywood Sportatorium tomorrow night at 8 p.m. All right, what are you talking about? It'll be nice to remember. And on August 22nd, see the Kings in concert with Louisiana LaRue at the Sunrise Musical Theater. A Stellador's concert presentation. <laughs> Looks like we got a couple of Queen fans in the studio. I'm Omerski, and we've got the entire uh, number that thing. Van Halen band. Hello! In right four here part in front harmony. of your naked steaming ears, W S H E, it's a Van Halen. <laughs> Prisoners of the fourth or dimension <laughs> and singing, singing, singing into the fourth or dimension. Beam up, Scotty. No sign of intelligent life down here. <laughs> Captain, where are the lithium crystals? Ah, oh, just whip out the flame. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to South Florida, guys. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, it's yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Here we go. Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. Sportatorium. You, have you ever played the Sportatorium before? Tonight. And, and then, Tonight. And then at the hotel after. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> We've had a lot of calls. People uh, want to know which hotel that is. So. What is that? The, um... Which Holiday Inn? <laughs> 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 I'm going right down the street there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, man. Before we get rolling, uh, I was just telling the guys, we're giving away a pair of David Lee Roth's oh, pants yeah. on the air. We've been talking about it for a few days. There's things, as you Not said. Not wash them. <laughs> obviously, nobody has yet. And, uh, <laughs> really? I've you put them on? I mean, we, they came in the mail. They just about walked out of here. And we yeah, had a change. And, and, hey, ki- and what kind of dance step did they do? <laughs> we, yeah. Okay, we're going to hold the pants up. We're holding the pants up now. Take the radio and place it against your body. Now, feel my pants as it travels up your spine into your mind. That's all right, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) uh, Put the radio Uh. down. (laughs) Your mom's going to walk you. You guys. (laughs) (laughs) Cot, dude. Really, man. You know what? We got a special surprise tonight for Miami. We're going to. Play all cheap trick songs tonight. How do you guys get this crazy early in the tour? Is it, uh, how long you been out? Just <laughs> <laughs> like you said, it's nice out. I think I'll leave it out. Here comes Mr. Ranger, y'all. You better put that out. No. <laughs> Gotta raise kids, gotta raise kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see, John Lennon's in South Florida. You got any messages for him? Him from Palm Beach. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, how about Yoko? <laughs> now, how far along in this tour are you? Voice. <laughs> how far into the tour are you at this point? Uh, we're on the downhill slide. <laughs> <laughs> Since day one. According to my probation officer, it's... Um, we started in March, and we're carrying on all the way through the summer. We're going around the world with this. We're carrying the 55-ton gun. 
ta 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 Strikes out on the road. And yet another spectacle of production and craze. <laughs> All right. First question, fifth try. <laughs> Where did you go? No! No, how'd you get were, together? Were you guys like totally sane when this tour started back no in March? influences here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all based on attitude and the lack thereof. <laughs> hey, you're gonna have to ask some questions. Right? Okay. No, going. hey, you guys are doing fine all by yourself. <laughs> now about those pants that we're giving away. We got the, we got the pants. We got a couple of Van Halen albums that the band signed and uh, these five little gold necklaces. You seen those necklaces? Yeah, nice. special Colombian gold, and it took a long time to weave them together, and it, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it crashed. And it crashed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is my sister you're talking about. <laughs> How about some music off the uh, latest album to get people in the mood for tonight's show? In the mood, get us in the mood. Well, yeah. Yeah. This uh, sounds like the natives are getting restless. For those of you out there in your cars. For those of you out there in your cars, I want you to take your right hand, reach down between your legs, and gently ease the seat back. Now, no, the seat full. <laughs> now, casually, grasp firmly but gently the body. Now, ease it to the right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, right you got to talk up to the post. Element 11. Everybody wants some at 103 She. <laughs> That was Van Halen on She They're here in the studio admiring. Admi I didn't know you guys were such Pat Benatar fans. We are. We're <laughs> sitting here looking. We're sitting here looking. We're trying to figure out what her legs are. really look like. We're sitting here looking at a at a picture of Pat Benatar. Here. Holding it in one hand. And um, Mike, what what is your favorite part of her body in this picture right here? The is background. The background. <laughs> yep, she ain't got no jackbone. <laughs> <laughs> What's a jack bone? Well, that's the that's Jack the Daniels get bone. <laughs> I get a Jack Daniels bone, but Pat's not doing it to me. Michael likes a girl who knows what she's doing because after a bottle of Jack, I don't. Pat <laughs> <laughs> Benatar, yes indeed. No, Ed, Ed told me a little story about her the other what? The other night he said, "Roll over, darling." She said, "I am over." <laughs> and was like, and what's and your favorite? Yeah, the part relationship has been going downhill ever since, and. Um, <laughs> People Magazine had to scratch the story. Ed, what's happening here? Uh, uh, what's going on? I don't want to discuss it. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's talk about brown M&Ms. Let's get serious now. Oh, uh, that's a simple case. What happened is we were playing in Pueblo, Colorado, and, um, you know, our con in our contract with the promoter, you know, for the stage size and for the, you know, the lights and the PA, the whole thing reads like a book. And so as a joke, in the middle, we stuck in a thing that says, no brown M&Ms. I think he skipped that page. <laughs> and uh, we walked backstage, and, and there were brown M&Ms. In the uh -oh. dish, so we told them we weren't going to play, and uh, we got very emotional about it, and we threw all the food around the dressing room, and uh, they decided to cancel all the concerts because the kids went crazy, people went crazy during the show, which of course we have no control over, and um, you know, they blamed the whole thing on my brown M&Ms, man, so... <laughs> Better be cool, or you're gonna get a note with a brown M and M in it through your window, Jack. Is, is that still <laughs> is that still in your uh, contract, that brown M and M? Brown M and M things get out of hand. That's right. I bet you haven't seen any since. <laughs> out of hand and on the wall. That's the title of our next album. <laughs> Disco uh, religious punk uh, effort with 15 pages of accompanying text, and um, <laughs> you know it's. Uh, so yeah, if you listen to it, we're gonna give you a test. Yeah, we're gonna give you a small, quickie quiz, and Go then on the uh, row with the moron tabernacle. <laughs> yeah. <and Yes. laughs> with all with all this time on the road, did you guys start any work towards the next wait, wait, album? Wait, that guy in the back, some rock. Dang, dang, dang. I gotta sing to that. Cut out. He's all right now. <laughs> Dave, oh, he's looking at Pat Benatar's picture again. <laughs> Dave, come on. 
<laughs> who, who else do you guys fans? We've already slammed Cheap Trick, Pat Benatar. <laughs> who else do we care about? What's while her name over there? there? <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Lang. That's Kelly Lang? <laughs> Who's Kelly Lang? News I Center 4. Never heard of her. News Center 4. The queen of the figure 4 leg lock. Oh my ah. god. <laughs> And she got Michael in a figure four, held it for 20 minutes the other night, man. He hasn't been able to look over his right shoulder since, I'm telling you. <laughs> Check him out on stage tonight. You think I'm lying? Well, Why would I lie? Well, I just met you. <laughs> While we're admiring all the posters in the studio, uh, what, what about this poster? Dave, hey, we're looking at that Pat Benatar poster. <laughs> It, we're looking at the poster that came with the latest Van Halen album. Uh, hey, that poster's made it to more ceilings than uh, any other poster in rock and roll in the last five years, man. So there's yeah. got to be a, there's got to be a story behind this poster. Yeah, there is a story. My love life is quadrupled. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you Ch know, but for the four the of us, and I think I can safely speak for the four of us in saying that even though it's a tough job, somebody's got to do it. And, uh, <laughs> we're, we're taking them one by one, uh, or two by two, or three by three, and. Um, we're trying to work our way, you know, across the uh, villages and hamlets of uh, America and the world. So, women and children first. So Absolutely, so. You know, women and children first is actually more of an attitude, you know, than uh, a title, you know. <laughs> I don't think he knows. <laughs> you catch, you, you I'm catch the drift. I'm finding you out the real fast. Over there? You know where I'm coming from, man. <laughs> Can you dig it? You we understand? knew you yeah. could. <laughs> <laughs> they said it couldn't happen here. It can't happen here. But it can. I was going to ask where I'm you're from, right. but you're obviously I'm from L.A. Right. I'd rather be the mayor. Hey, is, <laughs> hey is for no, horses. <laughs> What'd you say? With a, no. With a, with all he asked a question. He said we're from L.A. No. Wait, no. Silence. He's asking a question. Where are you from? I'm from Indiana. I'm from Chicago. Where are we from, Al? Amsterdam. Amsterdam, Amsterdam. what? Uh, <laughs> New Jersey. Amsterdam, New Jersey. Amsterdam, New Jersey, you got damn New York. And Amsterdam, New York, you got Connecticut. And then you connect to get the dots, and then you <laughs> go to Maine. <laughs> We're gonna uh, <laughs> we're gonna play a couple of commercials. <laughs> oh, gee, he's going to convalesce. Dave, David's getting out of control. We're gonna play a couple of commercials and come back and uh, and, and hang out with Van Halen. <laughs> you're not sleeping on one. You're just not sleeping. I can't get no traction. You're not sleeping on one. You're just not sleeping. I'm gonna throw up. Where were you sleeping last night? <laughs> Wouldn't it be better on a, oh, forget it, <laughs> <laughs> on a in a space yet. flotation net? <laughs> <laughs> Come and taste the world of Van Halen. <laughs> Open wide, <laughs> spread them <laughs> far. <laughs> we'll fill you up <laughs> right to higher. <laughs> right to higher. <laughs> <laughs> Backstage Open wide. Them far. <laughs> Backstage tonight, the exclusive Van Halen Club, where we'll <laughs> do bigger up front, poker in the rear. Uh, here we go. Hey, if you're not sleeping on one, you're just not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Incidental punishment after the ball is blown dead. <laughs> Jump ball. Jump ball. Jump ball. <laughs> Never realized you guys were so shy and laid back. Yeah, you will the next time you interview Journey, man. <laughs> <laughs>
We would like to thank you guys for coming hey, by well, here. Yeah, but you won't because. But we won't. We'll see you tonight at the Sportsatorio. <laughs> yes, indeed, friends. Be there, be square. We'll be hopping and bobbing and popping with the best bet for the boss beat at the top of the pop. Smash, go! Shut up, Jay! At the time, we tune for those with the texture chase. Ow, this is Van Halen out in the swamps, and I got no time to waste. I'm Diamond Dave. This is how are you, pal? This is Mike Two Eggs Eddie Style. Yeah. Eddie Van Halen, prisoner hey, of the fourth or third dimension. Good evening. Good evening. God, I love that interview, man. I can never get enough of it. I have that shit memorized. I've heard it so many fucking times. I recorded it back in the day, and. uh Honestly, that's not the one I recorded. I found YouTube one that sounded much better, and that's the one you heard. The one I taped was a recorder against uh, the stereo speaker. So, uh, so yeah, good thing somebody out there recorded it and put it up on YouTube. Anyway, I'm signing off. I'm sure I, met, I left so much out that there may be a concert review part two because I have so many great, great war stories. You got to remember, in two years, it's going to be me going to concerts for 40 years. So at the moment, it's 28 year, 38 years of me going to concerts. So uh, here's some plugs. Hey, I'm Dr. Fuck. And I'm the Ayatollah of Alcohola. And we are from the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast. If you want to check out some crazy, uncensored, unbiased, totally nuts reviews of classic hard rock and heavy metal albums, Check us out. You can get us on Podbean and iTunes. New episodes every Sunday. That's right. And we also do each other's moms. True. Free of charge. Well, mine charges. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mine's free. Ear Pillar, the podcasting and interview news site. To keep up with your favorite bands or artists and the podcasts or interviews where they appear. Go to earpeeler.com to find out what we're all about. You haven't listened to Mars Attacks podcast? What are you waiting for, man? Host Victor M. Ruiz brings you all types of hard rock and metal-based podcasts. You'll find everything from music-based episodes, interviews, to series such as ultra-sexy classic album series, where some of your favorite musicians, producers, journalists, and show hosts comments on the albums that push the evolutionary chains of hard rock and metal. Get with it and go to MarsAttacksRadio.com to find out more. Listen to The Rock Show with Gully and Joe. Go to all the W's, Gully, G-U-L-L-Y-A-N-D-J-O-A dot U-K. 8 p.m. U-K time, 3 p.m. Eastern. The Rock Show with Gully and Joe. Listen to it. Don't be a cunt. All right, Kiss Army. Since 2007, you've been getting podcast. The Kiss Audio fanzine for your ears. That's right, it's your podcast. Every month, the podcast crew, along with the Kiss Room, brings you Kiss Talk like no one else, whether it be roundtables, interviews with the band past and present, analysis, and great Kiss fun. Hi, this is Ace Frehley, and you're listening to Podkiss. Hi, this is Bruce Kulick, and you're listening to Podkiss. The Podkiss, the Kiss audio fanzine for your ears. Hey everybody, I'm Aaron. And I'm Chris. And we're from the Decibel Geek Podcast. And if you love this... (laughs) Then you'll love us. That's right. Brand new episode every single Monday. You can find us on iTunes and at decibelgeek.com. And the best thing is, it's rock and roll and it's always free. Music's most diverse podcast, starring Luke Innes, Greg Sid Bootlegs, and Mr. T from Germany. New episodes released every Saturday on Podbean, Podcast Addict, and iTunes. The True Alternative Podcast. Have you developed paralysis from trying to choose a movie on Netflix? Of course you have. There's too much garbage on Netflix to sift through. So join us on our podcast, We Watched It For You. We watch a bad movie every week and try to determine its watchability. 
We Watch It For You is for bad movie fans, B-movie fans, underground film fans, and cult movie fanatics alike. Don't miss an episode of We Watched It For You, a guide to the lesser-known movies of Netflix, available on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. Hello, my name is Lee Gerstman, and I have a podcast which is improvisational in time. The next episode might be 20 seconds away or might be 20 years away, but it's called The Lee Gerstman Show, and I do a lot of record reviews, but I also do editorials about women and food and other subjects, strange or otherwise, feel free to take a listen to The Lee Gersman Show on Spreaker. Thank ya. Hey, headbangers, you want your own radio show? Well, you got it. On Thursday nights here on that metal station, join me on The Dr. Fuck Show. Go in the chat room and I will make you my co-host. That's right. Everybody that joins me in the chat room, I discuss whatever you guys want to talk about. I'll mention your name. I'll say what you say. And we're going to go back and forth. And I'll even fucking play whatever request you want. Unless it sucks, then I ain't playing it because my show rules. And only songs that rule is allowed right here on that metal station. The Dr. Fuck Show airs live Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Hope to see you there. Well, no, no, fuck that hope. I better see you there, motherfucker. All right, and a couple more plugs. Uh, James McCormick, uh, he has a radio show and a podcast, Mind Over Metal. You can check it out on Spreaker and iTunes. Terrence Reardon and Friends, YouTube audio visual uh, review show. And uh, anybody else, if I forgot, please send me an ID so I can add it on to the show. So I'm signing off, and if you're hearing my voice now, thank you so much. You know, I know it's me babbling off for fucking two hours about all the shows I saw back in the day. Not all. I mean, I'm telling you, every show I mention is probably like not even a quarter of the amount of shows I've seen. And I know I've left a lot of great stories out that I will remember and get pissed off about it and write it down on a paper so there will be a part two unless uh, I get bad reviews on this show. And I also want to thank everybody for all the positive reviews so far, the first two episodes. And I hope this one gets a positive one, episode three. So I'm signing off and please petition, get Rob Halford on my show and I'll take John Bush and Robin Zander too. That is my goal. Vieira Vault signing off. Thanks again, everybody. Bye.